Well, the hero's journey is an archetypal narrative structure found in stories from cultures all over the world. Uh, the term was coined by Joseph Campbell, who was an American writer and editor who was fascinated by myths from various cultures and literary uh, traditions. He noticed that many heroic stories follow the same narrative stages, no matter which culture or time uh, period that they come from. Uh, as he grew older, his fascination became the focus of his studies as he analyzed classic and mythological texts and became convinced that all of our favorite classic stories from all time, all cultures, all civilizations have uh, what he called a universal backbone, uh, which he also called a monomyth. Campbell wrote this book in 1949 called The Hero with a, a Thousand Faces. The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And in it, he said this. He said, a hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered and a, device, and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. And so from there, he lays out uh, the 17 steps of the hero's journey, which we don't have time for. Uh, but, but in its simplest form, this path, this journey can be described in three stages. The departure stage, the initiation stage, and the return stage. And in the departure stage, the hero leaves his home community to go on a quest. In the initiation stage, the hero faces trials and tribulations until he achieves victory on his quest. And in the return stage, the hero goes home to his community with gifts and benefits, or in the church world, we would say blessings, all right? And so many of the greatest stories we know have a common path. Uh, the, the hero's journey is a tale as old as time, and it shows up over and over again, and it's become sort of a, a playbook or a cheat code that resonates with every human heart. And so examples in antiquity would be stories like the Odyssey, like Beowulf, like King Arthur. Uh, in the Bible, you can put this grid over the lives of, of guys like uh, Joseph and Moses and Samson and King Saul. Uh, in modern times, and again, this really became popular in 1949, and so many of the modern movies that have been made, uh, you see the hero's journey over and over again. So uh, in modern times, you see the hero's journey in movies like The Wizard of Oz, the Goonies, the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Superman, Spider-Man, The Karate Kid, The Matrix, Hunger Games, The Lion King, The Incredibles, Mulan, Moana, Shrek, Kung Fu Panda, and most recently, the Barbie movie and Wild Robot, okay? And so there seems to be this common thread, this common vision in every human heart that longs to go from where we are to another place, a better place, as a better uh, version of ourselves. And so we're, we're all looking for this straight path, and I would submit to you that this longing has been planted in you by the God of heaven, who the, the Bible says has set eternity in the hearts of every single one of us. So we are in the fourth and final week of a series that we've been calling Rebellious Fidelity. Again, Rebellious Fidelity defined uh, is a fierce and unwavering commitment to a cause or belief even in the face of opposition. Something or someone sits on the throne of every heart. Uh, we all give ultimate allegiance and authority to something in our lives, and I would submit to you that God must be that thing, and everything else, as I said the past few weeks, is the Flint River, right? It's the sinking sand and marshy land of Pisa, Right? It's the death of Ivan Ilyich. It's the ladder that you climb up to eventually fall off of. Amen. And so uh, there are many things competing for first place in our hearts, and it will take rebellious fidelity to keep God there. So in this series, we've been breaking down a famous passage in the Old Testament, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, uh, which says this, it's trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths, amen. And so we've looked at what it means to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Uh, we've looked at what it means to lean not on our own understanding. Last week through the topic of grief, we uh, talked through and discussed what it means to acknowledge 
God in all of our ways. And today we're going to finish by talking about how God directs our paths. All right. Now to help with this, I'm going to start by having my friend Kyle Wallace come up and he is going to share how God has directed his path out of addiction. So will you stand up with me and welcome him as he comes forward? I'll get your mic. How's it going, guys? Good. I'm Kyle. I'm your drummer, if you didn't know. And uh, I just wanted to start by praying first. So if you bow with me, I appreciate it. Jesus, uh, I just ask you to help me through this. I ask that um, you bless my testimony so that my testimony blesses you. We know that confession of our sins and shining your light on the darkness is, is where it's all at. We know that your strength is made perfect in weakness. So I just ask that you... Um, Strengthen me as I share my testimony to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I wrote this down because if I didn't, I could probably talk for an hour and a half, and I was asked specifically not to do that. So, um, so I was raised by two different households. Um, my mom and dad separated when I was about two years old. My dad was an atheist who had just utter resentment for God. I remember all throughout my childhood, he, he loved pointing out what he thought were contradictions in the Bible. Um, and my mom, on the other hand, was an addict who raised us with a meth lab in the house. My dad taught me that money bought happiness, and not just through his actions, but it was literally one of his teachings. He told us kids that money buys happiness. It was something I always disagreed with, but, and I knew at my core that it was wrong, but he insisted. My mom taught me that drugs was happiness. She taught me that drugs made it possible for her to show affection. She showed me how a person deals with their past, and she showed me that that was done with drugs. So it would be no surprise to find out that I grew to be somebody who stole money from people in order to buy drugs so that I could deal with my past. Because my mom and dad did not allow Jesus to invade their lives, some things that were passed down to me uh, from them originated from sin and not from God. I believe today that both of them tried to do what they thought was right. It's just that neither of them allowed Jesus to break their generational curses. My dad sat me down and watched a porn with me as his version of the sex talk. And that was actually the closest I ever felt to my dad. Um... My mom, the way she showed affection was taking me with her throughout all of her um, adventures as an addict. I watched her be abused by her dealers. I watched her sleep with her dealers. I watched her cheat on her boyfriends. And then at eight years old, I was the person that tried to help her through those times. And that was the closest I felt to my mom. So at a very young age, I was taught a very unhealthy version of what love looks like. Um, for 15 years, I went through life upstream without a paddle until I was prescribed 30 Vicodin for an ear infection. It was the first time I was introduced to a solution that numbed me. It was a solution for me that, that enabled me to not think about my past anymore. And it, it made me actually like myself because it made me feel like people liked me when I was on it. So fast forward about five years, it would be time for my first daughter to be born. I was 20 years old. I was with the person who's now my wife. Oh, she's not, oh, there she is. Yeah, round of applause for her for putting up with me. <laughs> I had a drug problem and all I wanted to do was be the dad that I wanted my dad to be. And even though I had a solution that allowed me to forget my past, what that solution did not do was help me with the present. I wanted to be a good dad. I wanted to be a good man for Stephanie, but I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to be sober and show love at the same time. The only example I had for sobriety was my dad, and I didn't feel loved by him. My mother, who used drugs, was the only one who I felt love from growing up, so that's the example that I ran with. I eventually graduated from Vicodin to shooting up heroin. 
and along the way I made many, many, many bad choices. All the more things I would be able to run away from with drugs and avoid looking at for a long time to come. If you wouldn't mind Ryan putting up the picture. So, so that's, where, that's where this mess le uh, led me to. But somewhere in this disastrous mess, God introduced himself to me. He loved me before I ever loved him. I remember being plagued by the number 666, okay? Uh, this number plagued me. It was everywhere I looked. It was on license plates. It was in books. It was on bumper stickers. It was everywhere. And I remember being so tormented by it that I eventually, for the first time, hit my knees and prayed to God, and I asked him to help me with this. And I didn't instantly get an answer, but I looked around my room, and I saw a Bible sitting at the top of a stack um, of books. And I believe I was told, open that book and open it to page 666. It was the first page of the New Testament. It's the only Bible I've ever seen that did that. That was God telling me, if you want to defeat the devil, it's with my son. So I started reading the book of Matthew, and I was introduced to Jesus, which is what led me to being baptized. Unfortunately, I continued using drugs after this until I eventually had a nearly fatal heroin overdose. It was 4th of July that day, and my family was supposed to be going to a 4th of July party, but they told me that something was whispering in their ear telling them not to go that day. And if they would have went, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today because they found me on my bedroom floor with my whole body completely blue, my heart hardly beating. Um, I had a near-death experience at this time. I remember going to a place that I could only describe as just complete bliss. I could have spent forever there. I was very comfortable, but something spoke to me and gave me a choice to either stay there or go back. And my daughter's face flashed in my mind. I made an internal decision that I, I'm not done yet. I need to go back. Right at that minute, I was revived by the fire department. Um, <clears throat> it wouldn't be until about seven years later when I became homeless, addicted to fentanyl and meth, that I would finally be desperate enough to face myself. Because when I went, when I, when I got baptized the first time and I, and I had that heroin overdose, I stayed sober for about 10 months and I dove into the Bible, I dove into the Word, but I didn't let the Word penetrate my life. All I did was became a parrot. And I became a very judgmental parrot at that. I just used the Bible to look at other people's sins, take other people's inventories, but I didn't let Jesus invade my life. I didn't have a relationship with him yet. It was too painful to look at those things. And like I was saying, it wouldn't be until about seven years later when I became homeless, addicted to fentanyl and meth, that God would make me desperate enough for a change. Um, this was in Manteca. While I was homeless, I was picked up off the streets by a sober living program named His Way. It was a Southern Baptist program. And they put me in a house where I could come down and I could start living sober and, and try to recover. Now, when you're coming down off of the drugs that I was on, it usually takes about two weeks to come down and you feel like you are absolutely dying. I've had COVID twice. I would take COVID over that any day. It's horrible. I was only on day two and I was in the shower and I, I was dying. And I remember thinking to myself, if I could just grab the hem of Jesus's garment, I could be saved like that woman in the Bible. And I believe today that somehow I actually touched Jesus' garment because when I did so and I told God, I'm defeated, I'm done, I don't have anything left anymore, I need your help, I was healed with such a magnitude that I was able to get out of that shower and I was able to start doing things to the point where the whole sober living house thought that I had actually snuck drugs into the house and relapsed. <laughs> right. It was, an ab it was a real miracle. Now, at that time, um, that's when I started letting Jesus into my life. That's when I started asking him for every step that I took before I took it. 
And that's what led me to being, um, to being able to come back here to Roseville from Manteca, where I, was, where I was placed right down the street from this house, or from this church, excuse me, and I was placed right down the street from Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is what God used in order to uh, help me face my past. He showed me how to pull all of my skeletons out of the closet and look at the deepest, darkest crannies of my life so that me and him could go through these things together and we could face the pain that I, so that I could heal. Yeah. He taught me how to rely on him. He taught me how to make amends to the people that I had hurt. He taught me how to be born again into a new family. He led me to this church. I'm by no means a finished product today, but what I can say is that I have a relationship with God today. I have an example of what a father is supposed to look like today. I have a church that loves me, and I'm able to love you guys back. I have a wife that loves me today, and I have kids that love me, and I'm able to be a husband and a father for them today. And that's what I got for you guys. Thank you so much for listening. As, uh, as Kyle was sharing his testimony, Aaron just leaned over to me and was like, why do we even preach? I mean, <laughs> you guys' stories, I think, does it all. Um, I do want to try to make it through this, though. So, listen, we, we all are drawn to a hero's journey. We're all looking for a straight path, but it's important um, that uh, Proverbs, th for us to understand that Proverbs 3, 6 is conditional, all right? So God making our path straight is dependent upon us trusting him, not leaning on our understanding and submitting all of our ways to him, which is to say, and this is one of the points I wanna make today, is that guidance isn't something God necessarily gives as much as it is something God does. Did you hear what I said? Guidance isn't necessarily something God gives as much as it is something God does. See, the Bible doesn't talk much about what you have to do to get God's guidance. It talks about the type of person that gets guided. See, it's not about doing something. It's about becoming someone. All right. And so there are four things that must be true of you if you want to receive the guidance of God. All right. I know it's 1128, I'm gonna make it through this. Okay, four things, four things that must be true of you if you wanna receive the, the guidance of God. Uh, Psalm 25 spells this out really well. I, I believe Psalm 25 is probably one of the best passages in scripture on the guidance of God. So let me read this to you. So starting in verse four, it says, make me know your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation for you, I wait all the day. Remember, Lord, your compassion and your faithfulness, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my wrongdoings. Remember me according to your faithfulness for your goodness sake, Lord. The Lord is good and upright. Therefore, he instructs sinner in the, sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are faithfulness and truth to those who comply with his covenant and his testimonies. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my wrongdoing, for it is great. Who is the person who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will dwell in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. All right, so uh, here's how you get the guidance of God, four, four ways. All right, you get the guidance of God. Number one, you have to know him. Number two, you have to obey him. Number three, you have to rest in him. And then number four, then you hear him, okay? So you know him, you obey him, you rest in him, and you can hear him, all right? So first, you have to know him. You have to know him. The psalmist uh, says it clearly in that passage, make me know your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. He instructs 
sinners in his way. He teaches the humble. He will instruct him in the way he chooses. You see it all through this passage. See, the psalmist is way more consumed with knowing God than knowing the path that God wants to send him on. Amen? And so if you want the, the guidance of God, you must know God's word inside and out. If you want the guidance of God, you must know his word inside and out. Now, I know that's frustrating to some of us because we want God's guidance at the snap of a finger, don't we? We want, we want it now. We want it now, right? But to know him means this takes time. See, we want the promotion at work before we have the training, before we have the experience, before we have the skill set to be successful. We want all the benefits of a relationship without commitment or emotional intimacy, which is evidenced by the fact uh, Kyle talked about, you know, being caught up in pornography. Uh, over $3,000 a second is spent on pornography in our country. Did you guys hear what I said? Every second, over $3,000 is spent on pornography. The porn industry makes more money annually. Its revenue is more than the NFL, the MLB, and the NBA combined, right? This is the culture we live in, right? This, this is what we live in. It's, it's I, want it, I don't want to have to know you, right? I, I want what I want now, right? Just give me what I want. Uh, J.I. Packer, he made this point really well. He uh, he wrote a book about knowing God, and he said this in this book. He said, if you're lost and you're driving around and you drive up to a corner and you see someone who looks like a local and knows the way and you ask for directions and he says to you, man, that, that's going to be really hard to get you to from here. But then he draws you a confusing map, and while you're looking at him, he sees your confusion, and he stops, and he says, he says, I'll tell you what, I'm going that way myself. Why don't I just get in the car? What he's doing here is instead of giving you guidance, he's giving you the guide, all right? See, see, we want abstract guidance, right? We want guidance, but we don't want the guide. We want directions, but we don't want the director, right? We say, yeah, yeah, I know God a little bit, and I know I need to know him more, but I just want the map. Give me the map. Where's the map? Right? And so the first thing you have to know about the guidance of God is that you have to know the guide. Right? Jesus said it this way. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. In other words, I'm going with you right? and learn of me, he says. All right? And so how, how do I get to know him? How do I get to know him? Open up the Bible and read it. I know it sounds simple. We all know it sounds simple. How, how hard is this for us? Open up the Bible and read it. It's not complicated. It's just costly. Right? Open the Bible and read it regularly. Read his word regularly. And it's not about not having time. Social experiment. Open up your iPhone. Go to settings. Go to screen time. Go to show categories. Look at everything under entertainment and social. You would be shocked how much time you have. And I'll just give you a little challenge, and I'll make it easy on you. I'm not telling you to give all that time up, just half of that time. If for six months you dedicated half of the time you see in there to engaging with God and his word, where would your life be? It's not about time. It's not about not having time. Right. You don't need guidance. You need, and I need, a guide. Right. You don't need a whole map. You, you wouldn't even understand the whole map. You need a relationship with a guide that is so constant that along the way you get the next direction and the next direction, and that's what it means to know him. Okay. And so that's the first thing. If you want the guidance of God, you have to know him. Secondly, you get the guidance of God by obeying him. Okay. You get it by obeying him. The psalmist says, all the paths of the Lord are faithfulness and truth to those who comply with his covenant and his testimonies. Then you see him uh, confessing sin. He says, do not remember the sins of my youth and my wrongdoings. Forgive my wrongdoings, for it, is, for it is great. And so once you know God's word, you'll also know if you're obeying it or not. Right? That's the beauty of knowing God's word is you start to say, 
oh, word, I, I can't do that, right? Like you just start to learn stuff, right? E- Eugene Peterson, um, I love this quote. He's, he calls this long obedience in the same direction. That's what we need. Uh, Tim Keller uh, says it this way. He says, there must be a saturation in the command will of God if you're ever gonna be able to discern the plan will of God. We want the plan will of God, but what you really need to know is the command will. Do what he's saying to do, and it'll help you. All right, the more you obey his summonses and his counsels and his commands, the more you cultivate prompt submission uh, to what he asks you to do, the more clarity you get about God's routine mercies in your life. Do you ever just sit around and think about God's routine mercies in your life? That you have health in your body. That you can breathe. That you have a wife who loves you, fellas. That you have a beautiful family, a home to live in. That we live in one of the safest nations in the entire world, right? Routine mercies, that the more you obey God, it it just seems like the more clarity you get about these things. The more you obey, the easier it is to obey, which makes discerning God's will easier. Let me give you some uh, passages of scripture on this. Luke 16, uh, 10 through 12 says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? I love how this reads in the message version. It's just cut and dry. It it says it this way. It says, if you're not honest in small jobs, who will put you in charge of the store? Now, you're saying, Sean, Sean, that's all about stewardship. Yeah, obedience is an indicator of whether you can steward the more that God wants to give you, all right? In the second verse, the psalmist is referring to the Exodus story where God miraculously delivers Israel from slavery and he leads them um, out of Egypt uh, and he's leading them to the promised land, but they have to go through the wilderness. And here was the response of the people of God. All right, here was the response, Psalm 106, 24 says they then they despised the pleasant land they did not believe his promise listen to this they grumbled in their tents that's a phrase they grumbled in their tents any tent grumblers in here you don't have to you don't have to implicate yourself they grumbled in their tents and they did not what's that word obey the lord And all of this led to a generation of people never reaching their destination, and instead, they died in the wilderness. They died in the wilderness. So it's not enough just to know God, to get his guidance. You must obey him as well. You have to obey him. Now, we're going to go over three and four. I'll try to make this quick, but it's really important to know that number one and number two are up to us, okay? We have to know God and we have to obey God. Those are up to us. Number three and number four, God does the heavy lifting. Hallelujah. All right. Okay. Three and four. So third is rest in him. Rest in him. The psalmist hits this as well where he says, for you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait all the day. Remember, Lord, your compassion and your faithfulness. Remember me according to your faithfulness for your goodness sake, Lord. The Lord is good and upright. All the paths of the Lord are faithfulness and truth. Over and over again, he's hitting this. And so one of the reasons why it's important to get to know God through his word is because the Bible is a chronicle of God's faithfulness. So it's a history book of God's faithfulness. By knowing God's works and his reputation, he proves himself. He proves himself. Resting in God means you trust he's going to get you to your destination. You trust him. Um, I was listening to um, Havila Cunnington preach the other day. Uh, she just preached recently. She was actually preaching on Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, coincidentally. And she said a few things I think will help here. She said, if you lack trust, you probably don't know God's character. Think of that. If you lack trust, you probably don't know God's character. She also talked about how it's more important to trust God than to get clarity. 
Think about that. It's more important to trust God than to get clarity. All right. And she told a story about Mother Teresa who hosted a man that volunteered to work with her in the House of the Dying in Calcutta, uh, India. And she asked the man uh, who came and worked with her after a while, she asked the man, what could I do for you? And the man said, will you pray for me? She said, what do you want me to pray for? Pray, he said, that I have clarity. Her abrupt response surprised him as she said, no, I will not do that. And when he asked her why she wouldn't do it, this is what she said to him. She said, clarity is the last thing you are clinging to and must let go of. I have never had clarity. What I have always had is trust. So I pray that you will trust God. That's fire. Is it bad if I confess something? To, I want to confess something in church to you guys. I don't, I don't have a ton of clarity about my future. No, I don't have much clarity about my future. But one thing that I've been learning the, gosh, what's is it, October? So about t almost 10 months of being in full-time ministry, one thing I have learned is I just need to trust God. If I just trust him, I've just learned that I'm able to trace him. And I wish I could tell you guys, I know exactly what the future of The Rock is. And we're going to do our best in a couple of weeks to cast some vision. And we're super excited about it. But if God wants to flip that thing on its head. I remember 2020. We went into 2020 and we're like, man, we're about to rock it. Vision. God's giving us all the, and then the whole world shut down. And we were like, what the actual heck is happening? It just happens that way. So the guidance of God comes to those who trust him, to those who rest in him. So relax. All right, relax. Relax. When you walk with the Lord, you cannot screw up your life. Did you hear what I said? When you walk with the Lord, you cannot screw up your life. Some of you guys don't believe me. So let me prove this to you. All right, there's a man in scripture, his name is Jacob. Uh, Jacob is a hot mess express. I mean, you read the story of Jacob in the book of Genesis and you squirm in your seat, right? So he sins against his father and deceives his father. He cheats and steals from his brother Esau and as a result, he has to run away from home, never again to see his mother, who is probably the only person in his life that he knew really loved him. And so he becomes a servant in his uncle's land. He falls in love with the woman of his dreams, but he gets tricked into marrying her sister. And ultimately he ends up with two wives, which I couldn't imagine. <laughs> like it is my life to please Amy Patterson. I could not imagine times two. He ends up with two wives. And just when you think he has messed his whole life up, he has children from both wives and from one of them comes Joseph, who eventually saves the most powerful nation in the world in that time and saves his own people, the Israelites. And from the other wife comes the Messiah. Imagine what he could have accomplished if he hadn't messed his life up. As much as it seemed like he tried to mess his life up, God was faithful. And that's the same for you as well. If you seek to know him and obey him, you can rest in his faithfulness as well. Lastly, we're going to wrap up here. So worship team, you guys can come back. Lastly, we hear him. We hear him. The psalmist wraps up this passage by saying, the secret of the Lord is for those who fear him and he will make them know his covenant. And that word secret there means the inner counsels of God. The inner counsels of God. Um, Augustine uh, said this way, he said, God provides the wind, man must raise the sail. Uh, Robert E. Lukacs said, without God, we cannot, 
without us, God will not. And so it's great to know that God not only wants to walk with us relationally, but he is committed to working out his purposes on earth in partnership with us. He wants to walk with us. He's not just wanting to do this on his own. He wants to walk with you. God wants to speak to you more than you want to hear him. He wants to speak to you. Uh, during the, uh, the Olympics, uh, the men's USA basketball games, they just, they just kind of happen at the weirdest time of day, and so I could never watch them live, and so I had to record all the games. Um, and um, obviously, they were going for gold. Nothing less would have been satisfactory, and so you're kind of watching their whole journey. They get to their last two games, and I recorded uh, the games, and I watched the games after they happened. All right. One of the games, which it wasn't the medal game, the first game, um, I watched not knowing the result. All right. And I just remember sitting there watching that game and I was yelling. I was pacing all over the room. Amy remembers this. I was pacing all over the room. I was bouncing off the walls. I was like, I was just going crazy. I, I was sweating. I felt like I played in the game when the game was over. It was crazy, amazing. And then the second game, somehow someone had accidentally told me the outcome of the game, and so I still watched it because it was a medal game. And it was exhilarating, it was a great game. It, it was super fun to watch, but I just remember just sitting on my couch and I just was unmoved. I was just, there was just nothing, I, I, I was emotionally disconnected from it because I knew the outcome. So no matter what was happening in the game, they got down, the other team came back, whatever, I was like, ah, USA wins. Like it never moved me, you know? And so I say this to make this point, that you don't want God as a fortune teller that just tells you your future and then you go try to live in it. You don't want that. We think we do, but you don't. We don't want that. If God told you your whole future, you would either wimp out, right? because you would be overwhelmed with what he's telling you, right? You would wimp out or you would, be, you would become uninterested and have no emotional investment. And so as you walk with him, as you seek to know him, as you obey him, as you rest in his faithfulness, you begin to hear the inner counsels of God, right? If it is habitual for you to draw near to him and seek his presence, he will tell you his secrets. Uh, one of my good friends, uh, Paul Gottlieb, he um, actually pastors here in the area. He pastors a church in Rockland. Uh, and he said this, and I kind of give, I don't think it's his phrase, but I give him the credit. He always said this to me. He said, God doesn't tell secrets to strangers. God doesn't tell secrets to strangers. The closer you get, the deeper you go, the better you hear his voice. Amen. You stand with me. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. So we are all drawn to a hero's journey. We are all looking for a straight path and God is committed to making you the type of person he guides and hears his voice because of the work of his son, Jesus. See, Jesus knew his father. Jesus obeyed his father. Jesus rested in his father. Jesus did everything right and yet everything went wrong for him. Jesus was beat to within an inch of his life and then he was hung on the cross. And as Jesus hung there dying, the Bible says that he yelled out for his father, but his father didn't answer him. Consider this, he did all the things. He knew him, he obeyed him, he rested in him. He calls out for his father and his father is silent. He doesn't answer. See, Jesus didn't hear from his father, 
so that you and I can. It's for us. Jesus is the ultimate hero. Jesus left heaven, the departure stage. Jesus went to the cross, the initiation stage. Jesus rose from the dead and he's coming back for us, the return stage. Jesus is the hero of a thousand faces, guys. He is the hero of a thousand faces. Jesus is everything we need him to be when we need him to be it. Amen. There's this, uh, there's a song out. I just remembered it. There's a song out that has this, uh, these words in it that I love. And the song, it says, Jesus is strength in our weakness. He is our banner in the war. He is our anchor in the ocean. He is our shelter in the storm. He justifies us. He calls us friend. He wrote us in his story, the one that never ends. So we're going to pray in a minute before we do. As we close out this series, I just want you to consider. If you're here today and you would say, Sean, I want to, I want to walk with the Lord. Here's what I sense by the, by the spirit of God. If you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, I'm not asking you to walk anywhere. I'm asking you as the, as the song said earlier today, I'm asking you to run to the father. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior, run to him now. And so if you're here today, you would say, Sean, I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want the rebellious fidelity that you're talking about. I want to learn how to trust in the Lord with all my heart. I'm done leaning on my own understanding. I want to submit to him. I want to acknowledge him in all my ways. If you're here, you would say, Sean, that's what I need. Just raise your hand. We just want to pray for you. We just want to pray. I see you, brother. I see you. I see you. I see you. Oh my goodness. Listen, you can ill afford to wait and wait and wait. And the longer you say no, the easier it is to say no in the future. You harden your heart, right? The Bible says don't harden your heart. And the reason why is because the more you harden your heart, the easier it is to harden your heart in the future. But I'm telling you now, and one of the first things and all over the room, I guarantee you for all of the believers in the room, they would tell you one of the only regrets we have when we give our lives to Jesus is that we didn't do it sooner. And so this is my last call. Sean, I need Jesus. Again, I, I'm looking out and I see a lot of family, but I never want to think, I never want to take for granted that there's someone in here that's not walking with Jesus. Slip your hand up. We just want to pray for you. Amen. I see you, brother. If you're here today and you would say, Sean, I've been walking with the Lord for a while, but man, have I gotten off track. For four weeks, you've been talking about rebellious fidelity, and that has nothing to do with my walk with Jesus. I want to break shame off of you right now and tell you, take the next step. Take the next step. And for you, taking the next step, is today getting on your knees before God and saying, God, I will follow you wherever you go. Amen. And so if you're here today, you say, Sean, I, I know Jesus, but I just, I need prayer, man. I, I, I need to, I need to recommit. Raise your hand. I just want to pray for you as well. Okay. Amen. All over the room. So as our prayer team comes up, I'm just going to pray for us. And here's my challenge for you today. Again, this is the end of a series uh, this is my challenge for you today. If you need prayer, if, you, if you're real and you're like, man, I, I need to give my life to Jesus, I would challenge you, don't just walk out of here, right, after I pray. Why don't you come up and talk to us? We want to partner with you. We want to pray with you. We want to believe with you. Amen. Father, we just thank you. We thank you that you are here. We thank you, Lord, that you said in your word that you stand at the door and knock, and if anyone would open it, you would come in 
and sit and dine with them. God, there are people in this room who for the first time are opening up that door. There are people in this room who came here who had no idea they would be doing this, but here we are. Holy Spirit, would you come into their lives? Would you captivate their hearts? Would you show them that all they're running was from a God who just wants to love them? Come into their lives, Lord God. Forgive them for their sins. Give them repentant hearts, that there is a literal turning away from sin that we have to do. Lord, give them the courage to be able to do that. And as they do that, God, help them to see just how present you are, how faithful you are. That even in the midst of bad decisions, even in the midst of of things they've done that they would never want to tell anyone, Jesus, you knew it and you were still here. God, and for my brothers and sisters in here who just need some encouragement, for those who are, who are tired from the journey, God, would you help them to see that you're not asking us to sprint as your people, you're asking us to walk with you. Help us to rest in your faithfulness. God, we wanna hear your secrets. We wanna hear the inner counsels of God. Teach us to be people who know you and obey you. Give us all rebellious fidelity. Lord, help us to seek you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, everyone said.